<coughs> very much indeed. I mean, I think you rather somewhat unwisely uh, asked politicians to speak without a clock being visible. So I shall try to keep half an eye on my, my watch to keep within a reasonable time. And I want to start with um, acknowledging two things immediately. First, that as Douglas Flint said in his remarks, you know, there is an inherent degree of unpredictability about events at the moment. Uh, and I think anybody who looks at what has been going on within the European Union over the last two or three years will have seen that illustrated. And secondly, I take it as a given that what happens in the Eurozone, what happens in this massive market of 500 million people, our closest neighbours, our most important trading partners, is of inherent importance and significance to what happens in the United Kingdom. And the idea that we can somehow sort of step aside from all this and simply uh, pretend that it is going on over the channel and that it won't affect us is to live in a fool's paradise, uh, that it is incumbent upon any British government to seek to influence, so far as we can, uh, developments within the European Union in a way that protects and advances the interests of the United Kingdom and the collective interests of European countries. And that certainly in cur the current climate, either a further significant shock to the Eurozone or a period of prolonged depression and declining demand within the Eurozone would be profoundly bad news for our hopes for economic growth and increased prosperity for our own people. And I want to focus my remarks upon three broad propositions. The first one is that the stability of the Eurozone is in the interests of the British people and of the British economy. I recall a, a conversation I had with President Barroso last year where he said to me that he spent roughly eight out of ten of his waking hours thinking, worrying and working on Eurozone matters. There's no doubt in my mind that the, uh, the crisis in the Eurozone has come to dominate the limited amount of time, energy and attention which exists at the level of top political leaders uh, in the main member states and in the European institutions. And inevitably that has taken attention and time and energy away from other incredibly important subjects. And we want that focus to be back on issues to do with growth and trade and the single market. But I also think that we shouldn't underestimate in the United Kingdom the uh, extent of the political commitment to the single currency uh, amongst the 17 participants in it. I think it's sometimes quite a difficult thing for to the British voters, uh, British politicians to grasp because our history is different, our economic circumstances are different. I I'm, I'm, make no secret of the fact I'm no enthusiast for Britain joining the Euro and I'm, I'm very content that we took the decision to remain and stay outside it. But when you talk to German or French or Italian or Spanish or Portuguese leaders, you're immediately struck by the way in which they see the continuance of the single currency and the development and strengthening of the single currency as not only in their economic interests, but as something of profound symbolic political importance to their sense of uh, identity and uh, national, that national well-being. Um, and we would be foolish to underestimate that. And as Mark Hoban said earlier, there is now a, an economic logic which George, George Osborne has described as a remorseless economic logic that is propelling the Eurozone from the single currency monetary policy and interest rate towards greater integration of their fiscal arrangements and of economic decisions. And of course, this is going to throw up political tensions because there is an inevitable tension between fiscal integration on the one hand, which you can say is a matter of economic logic, and on the other, the reality that you have voters who want to be able to sack people who take the main economic policy decisions, and how is 
that democratic accountability to be accommodated within uh, the framework of supranational fiscal integration. Now, you know, I mean, that's one of the reasons I you know, always supported Britain staying outside the Eurozone, because I felt that was the logic of developments. But that is something which the Eurozone 17 have to confront. And again, I don't think we should underestimate in the UK the extent to which there is in much of the rest of Europe a profound political commitment amongst voters as well as amongst the political elites to the idea of European unity and European integration. Um, you know, I sometimes compare this to how British voters think about the health service, that, that uh, um, you know, for many, many people right across Europe, given the history of Europe in the 20th century, European unity and integration are things that are self-evidently good, fine, noble, and therefore we should have more of it whenever possible. Um, so I think the politics is not necessarily the same in some uh, other European countries as it may be here. Um, there, there is a need for this action by the Eurozone to move to fiscal integration to take place, as Douglas said, said a moment ago, we're seeing the fragmentation, uh, the, the, in a sense, the renationalization of, the, the, of banking markets uh, as a consequence of that crisis and the growth of mistrust between institutions around Europe. And the various ideas that are coming forward for you know, what is termed a banking union at the moment, I mean, some elements of which might be under existing uh, European uh, treaty arrangements, some of which might involve proposals for treaty change, are a logical consequence of that debate. And our role uh, from London will be to support the Eurozone in trying to restore stability, find a way forward, while at the same time uh, being very clear that we have to protect the integrity of the single market and the need for decisions which by treaty should be taken at 27 to remain the province of the European Union at 27. And one reason we want the banking union to, to go forward, one reason we want stability in the Eurozone, is that we want to see Europe focus upon what Andrew Kahn alluded to in his opening comments, this massive uh, strategic challenge for Europe of the shift of uh, economic power and influence away from the developed economies towards the growing economies of Asia and Latin America, not just you know, the BRICs, it's, it's the Indonesias and Malaysias and Mexicos and uh, Turkeys uh, as well. And you all know the statistics and the evidence of that um, better than I do. But it seems to me that if Europe is going to be able to promise its citizens either the, the quality of life, the material standards of living, or the degree of social protection, which voters throughout Europe now take for granted, then collectively we have to raise our game in terms of growth and of competitiveness, and we need to do so quickly. And from a British perspective, that does mean strengthening the single market further, I mean, financial services has been a global success story, not just for, for the United Kingdom and London, but for Europe as a whole. But there are many areas in which the single market is not complete. Um, last year, 40% of European citizens bought something online, but fewer than one in uh, 10 of those transactions took place across a national frontier because there is no digital single market to provide a framework for either company to company or retail digital trade. There's no single internal market in energy. Even the existing services directive is uh, not fully implemented. And if my, my friend, the German ambassador, is here, I would say to him, Britain wants to see more Europe. We'd like to see Germany implement the services directive fully. Uh, you travel to my constituency on the train. You're traveling in a, uh, a railway owned by Deutsche Bahn. Um, if you switch on the electricity in my constituency, you're switching on a supply owned by a French company. I want companies to have the same freedom to buy into French uh, energy companies and German uh, railway companies as other Europeans do to come and invest in our industry, to see the single market develop in that way. Secondly, we need to see 
uh, improvements in trade. We need to do a lot more in terms of the, the UK. I mean, it's not the subject for this uh, conference, but it's, it's something that the Prime Minister, William Hague, give the highest priority to. If we could raise our game as a country to match the average of Germany, Italy and France with the emerging markets or with Central and Eastern Europe, we would make an appreciable difference to our own uh, GDP and our own growth rate. And that is something we're determined to try to do. But we need, as Europe, to take advantage of the immense opportunities that globalisation and the rise of the emerging economies uh, give us. Yes, in some sense it's a challenge, it, but, but it shouldn't be seen as a threat. You know, if 10% of the uh, electorate in Indonesia or India get to the sort of living standards that our fellow citizens take for granted, those are massive markets for British and for European goods and services. And so the UK message to Europe is we should embrace this challenge because it is free trade with the world that has brought us prosperity in the past and which we'll do again in the future if we can meet the challenge and raise our standards of competitiveness. And third, we need to uh, improve our growth prospects by having smarter, less costly and less burdensome regulation. It costs four times as much to set up a new business in the European Union as it does to set up a new business in the United States of America we can do a lot more at European level to cut not just the administrative cost of European regulation upon business, but of all European regulations upon business. A start has been made by the Commission, but there are still too many examples of directives coming forward despite impact assessments showing that they would diminish growth and cost jobs and make life for business more difficult and that culture needs to be changed if Europe is to make its living in the world where we are now. My third and final proposition is that financial services is essential for the growth of the real economy and that a successful city of London is and should be perceived as an asset not just for the United Kingdom but for the European Union as a whole. And I don't think we collectively have got this message across with sufficient clarity or sufficient force. If you go around a lot of European capitals, you will hear this mythology about um, how the Anglo-Saxons sort of were both responsible for the um, 2008 crash and now are seeking to destroy our euro. Um, I've had one minister from a, a, a country I will not name Who's, who's denounced to me the europhobic comments in the British press about his country's economy. And when I questioned him further, he was talking about the Financial Times, not the Daily Express. Um, and we need to do more to demonstrate, not to Hector, but to demonstrate why a successful London uh, is good for Europe, why it's in Europe's interest to have one of the global financial services centres as part of the European Union. And I think that involves both getting the customers of financial services to speak up more, so you know, Rolls-Royce or GKN or BAE Systems and their counterparts in other countries saying, we use the financial services industry to make a success of our manufacturing and our service businesses that employ thousands of people right across the European Union. And it means that we have to um, raise our game in terms of getting the message across in other capitals and with the European institutions. I mean, I the, the Lord Mayor, um, the bosses of... Um, it's City UK, you go, go and speak, I know, to uh, audiences in some of the major European capitals and go to Brussels, but I think this should be a normal part of the routine. You know, perhaps the Lord Mayor should go every year to the European Parliament and give a speech about uh, the importance of the City of London and what it brings to Europe as a whole. We should be more vociferous about the millions of French workers 
whose pension savings are being managed by funds in London. We should be speaking up about the fact that energy companies all around Europe have their exposure to dollar movements hedged by firms operating out of London. We should be shouting from the rooftops about the fact that if you are a Central or Eastern European country and you are wanting an ambitious privatisation or PPP programme, then where will you look for both the capital and the expertise, if not to London, with its concentration of financial services institutions and partnerships? And that message has not yet got across, and government and the industry, I believe, need to work more energetically in partnership to achieve that through our network of embassies, through the various government departments that are there to work uh, alongside you. All of us need to raise our game. I think we have got a very good story to tell, and I believe profoundly that if Europe is to have a future that is prosperous and competitive, that a prosperous, competitive, profitable financial services industry has to be a key part of that endeavour and of that success. Thanks very much for listening. Happy to take any questions you've got. Yes, sir. Uh, David, uh, Mark Tennant from Scottish National Enterprise. Um, can I, you said, I think, that um, Europeans were looking for more Europe, more integration. Yeah. If that's the case, and if at the core of the Euro crisis is the lack of integration and the lack of fiscal coordination, why aren't governments now laying out a roadmap to take us there if they want it so much anyhow. I mean, you're, the, the risk mark is you're asking me to speak for 17 other governments, um, yeah, you which is each, well, each, account, they're each accountable to their own electorate. So I think that's, that is the, the answer to you. It, is, it goes back to my point about there being a tension between the, the economic logic that if you have a single currency monetary policy and interest rate, then you're going to have to start moving towards some greater integration of fiscal policy in particular and economic policy making more, more generally. And the fact that the, um, the, the politics of Europe is still organised primarily on a national basis. And you know, to take the obvious example, I mean, it's no secret that German voters um, are fed up with, as they see it, being asked to shell out in order to support people in other countries who have been, they would say, profligate and irresponsible. And you know, one here, here's the slogan reported, well, the saying reported about why should I work into my mid-60s to allow the Greeks to retire at 55? And so they, you know, that, and that, that pressure is on Angela Merkel, therefore, not to, you know, Provide, in effect, provide a guarantee from German taxpayers, um, or at least not without some bigger say for German taxpayers and German uh, institutions in how European economic policy should be run. Now, having said that, I mean, you, you get, I mean, th those tensions are real, uh, and you see it the other way in some of the peripheral countries—a resentment at being dictated to by by others. But having said that, and I remember a conversation with. Um, uh, seen a UMP man in Paris who said to me, look, actually, at the end of the day, people may have feel a bit uncomfortable, but actually, the commitment to European unity, the sense that we have to do this, um, because it's part of our, our destiny, part of how we see ourselves as French now, as part of be, being part of this bigger European enterprise, is... Uh, in the last resort, more important still. Now, it, it is, has to be for the Eurozone countries to work out how to reconcile democratic accountability with uh, the requirement, the economic requirements of having a single currency. But it seems to me some of the ideas that are you know, coming out now are moving them uh, in that direction. How they make it democratically accountable, they have still to work out. Yes,
Louise Harvey from FTI Consulting in Brussels, and I've been in Brussels for about 20 years. Um, I wanted to thank you very much for your remarks. Um, I thought that you were absolutely spot on as far as um, the political will amongst Eurozone members to make sure that um, the, the project um, is a political success. Um, and I also wanted to pick up on your last point um, about the importance of the city uh, positioning itself uh, as a European mm -hmm. Uh, uh, something valuable for Europe. And uh, to that end, uh, one suggestion would be that the city UK actually should be called the city Europe. Um, <laughs> but I wanted to, um, I wanted to uh, also, however, ask you, um, the title of your uh, speech was meant to be UK leadership in the EU. And um, to be frank, uh, I'd like to see more of that. And I'd like uh, perhaps you to make a few remarks about how you see uh, the UK within the EU context at the moment. Thank you. Okay. Um, I mean, I'll, 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 Louise, I'll skate lightly over your, your first comment. It, it, I, mean, tip to, I mean, just give you an another anecdote. Of what needs to? I mean, I was having lunch with a foreign minister of uh, a small member state, and I did my pitch on a couple of uh, financial services directives that were then in the headlines, and he listened very contentedly to me, and he pulled the card out of his pocket. He said, yes, financial services, we understand this is very important for the United Kingdom. <laughs> that was it. You know. And for a lot of European, small European countries who don't have a significant industry of their own, this is not a big deal. Um, and so we, we have to demonstrate why it matters for them at a European level, it's not, no, not just, it becomes then more than the matter of this is a UK interest and we'd like some help from you. Okay, well, what will you give us in return? You're into a nation-to-nation uh, -nation horse trade. We'd go above that. Um, UK leadership. I mean, part of the problem with the 80% uh, the of time being spent on Eurozone matters is by definition, you know, that uh, means we're to some extent on the, on the periphery there because we're not in the Euro, we're not going to join the euro. Um, and as I said earlier, I'm no, I've no problem with, with that position whatsoever. But I think actually, Louise, if you, if you look at what has happened with the history of the European Union, or with where the European Union is, is now, um, I can give you plenty of examples. And if you look at the history of the EU, first of all, what are the two great successes of the European Union in its history? One was the creation of the single market, something that would not have been possible without the work of Arthur Cofield as commissioner and the political energy of Margaret Thatcher backing him up and uh, you know, enabling that to go through. And secondly, because we're always accused in Britain of being, oh, you're, only, you're, you're, you're in it for, uh, for, for just like, like a shopkeeper. You know, you're only interested in, in markets. There's no um, sort of political uh, uh, sort of commitment then. Yeah, okay, we, we don't have, but our history is different. We don't have the sort of the emotional commitment to European unity that a lot of the continental European countries do, for reasons I completely understand and respect. But look at enlargement. And let me go to Margaret Thatcher again. When she made the, I would quite happily describe the Bruges speech as one of the great speeches about um, uh, development of Europe, because what she did in that speech was to single out the uh, Prague and Warsaw as great European cities, along with Paris and Bonn and London, at a time when that was not fashionable, when people were not expecting the Berlin Wall to crumble. And when the Berlin Wall did come down, it was the governments of Margaret Thatcher and John Major uh, that led the way in arguing that those newly liberated European countries ought to be admitted into the European Union. And if I look at the enlargement project, I see a huge contrast between Eastern and Central Europe in the 20 years from 1919 to 1920, tyranny, civil war, dictatorships of left and right, uh, all sorts of tensions, and the 20 years from 1989-90 up to the present, the growth of democratic institutions, human rights, and the rule of law. And I believe the institutionalization of those values through the European Union is a very large part of the explanation for that beneficial contrast. 
And if I bring it up to date and see where we are now, I would say look at the March European Council conclusions, uh, which were all about growth, competitiveness, developing the single market, deregulation, a need for a big push on trade. That came about because David Cameron got a group of 11 other heads of government together, joined by about five others in the final week, in the run-up to the European Council, to say these are the things that matter if our uh, European citizens are to prosper in the future. We've got to get this on the agenda and really make the Commission sit up and take notice and take forward a programme of action on these points. And that we will continue to do. Another thing away from this, this conference, foreign policy, Iran, Syria, uh, the ambitious response to the uh, revolutions in North Africa and the Middle East. European policy has been, to a huge extent, influenced by British priorities and British initiatives when it comes to all those major foreign policy steps. So I would say that Eurozone, yeah, that's a, very important. It's, it's a case apart. Look at how Europe has been developing as a whole. You will see Britain continuing to be a leading influence in that. Thank you.